Hey team, so Taylor Swift's 10th studio album, Midnight's, comes out this Friday, and the rollout cycle has been eventful, messy, chaotic, and that's especially true for the Gaylers. If you don't know, Gaylor refers to a community of mostly queer people online who believe that Taylor Swift is secretly gay, or bi, depending on who you ask. It's a theory with history. It goes back all the way I think to the release of 1989, and the community slowly but steadily grew with the release of every album since then. But the rollout cycle before the release of this newest album I think has made a lot more Swifties aware of the rumors and just how serious the Gaylor truthers are. And honestly, I think a lot of Swifties have become Gaylor since the announcement of the Midnight's album. In this video, I just wanted to explain some of the theories that contributed to the rumors leading up to the announcement of Midnight's, and also to document what it was like to be in the Gaylor community during the album promotional cycle, especially because so many people in the community believe that Midnight's might finally be her coming out album. Also, this video is for everyone. If you're a Gaylor and you're worried that I'm gonna be a homophobic Hitler, don't worry, I'm not. If you're a Hitler and you're worried I'm gonna be some delusional lunatic who believes every wild theory I've ever heard, don't worry, I'm not that either. If you're just a Swifty and you've never heard of the Gaylor theory or you're just now getting into it, don't worry, this video will be accessible to you too. I'll take the time to define my terms. Like, if you've never heard of the term Hitler, I'm sure you got it from context clues, but it's a Swifty who believes that Taylor Swift is, in fact, a straight woman. Some Gaylers use it as a derogatory term for specifically Swifties who have heard the Gaylor rumors and theories, but choose to defend Taylor's straightness with their full chest anyways, but I'll be using it in a more general sense throughout the video. I'll use it to refer to the casual fans and the hardcore Gaylor haters alike. And if you're not a Swifty at all, well, I don't know why you're watching this video, but it should be interesting for you too. Before we get started, I do have to give a disclaimer. As much as I would love to be some unbiased third party in my reporting of this story and documenting of this moment. I'm not. I am, in fact, a massive Taylor Swift fan. I've been aware of her since like the Fearless era with Love Story, White Horse, and You Belong With Me, and my sisters became really big fans, I think around the release of Red, but I was solidified as a Swifty in 2017 when Taylor dropped Look What You Made Me Do. That was the first time I'd ever stayed up till midnight to listen to a song, and I was not disappointed. I think I was the only one Everyone else seemed to be a little disappointed. Somehow that's not even gonna be my hottest take in this video. I just like it. Let's get started. You may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Taylor Swift is boy crazy. That's like the one thing that everybody knows about her, right? That she's a serial dater of men. To you, I would say, what are you, stuck in 2014? No, seriously, that's literally like exactly what Blank Space was about how easy it is for the media to portray a young successful woman as a serial dater because misogyny. When you think about it though, having boy crazy so inseparably tied to your public image would make it easier for her to stay closeted for longer, right? Which is exactly what the Gaylers think has happened. The question then becomes, if Taylor Swift is so gay, why in the world is she still closeted in the year of our Lord 2022, when Donald Trump came out as bisexual in 2020? I'll kiss every guy, man and woman, man and woman. Look at that guy, how handsome he is. I'll kiss him. I'll kiss the guys and the beautiful women and them. Everybody, I'll just give you a big fat kiss. It does seem odd, but let's remember how and when Taylor got her start. Her debut country music album, Taylor Swift, came out in 2006. I don't know if you remember what it was like for gay people in the country music scene in 2006. I don't remember it either because I was like five, but I've heard it, it was not kind. Since then, Taylor was with the same record label for her next five albums through 2017. This is the same record label that since she's left it, she's been very vocal about how it stifled her personal voice. Okay, but what about since then, when she released Lover in 2019, an album that she fully owned herself, that she released in a partnership with a record label that respects her personhood, and an album with a full-on gay anthem as a lead single, shade never made anybody less gay. arguably too. Hey kids, spelling is fun! Why didn't she come up then? Here's the part of the story where we arrive at the theory and evidence that really first convinced me to start taking the Gaylor community seriously. Let's talk about the Billy Porter rainbow dress. Billy Porter is an actor and, according to Wikipedia, 
the first openly black gay man, I mean, <laughs> first openly black, he was the first openly gay black man to win a lead actor Emmy in 2019. What else happened in 2019? Stonewall 50, World Pride, New York City. 2019 was the 50 year anniversary of the 1969 Stonewall riots, a moment in history considered to be one of the most important demonstrations for the advancement of LGBTQ rights in the history of the country. So this anniversary was a big deal. New York City was hosting World Pride and they named it Stonewall 50. It was the largest queer event in the history of the world. There were events going on during the entire month of June and the month was set to end with an explosive parade on the 30th. At the parade that Sunday, four million people were in attendance. For reference, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade usually has around three and a half million. Enter Christian Serrano, fashion designer and winner of Project Runway season four. Taylor has worn dresses by Serrano a couple of times her Wonderstruck dress and this dress from the Wildest Dreams music video were both designed by Christian Serrano. Then, in early April of 2019, Serrano confirmed that he was working on another dress for Taylor. I've done two dresses for her yeah. in the past for music videos. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. But we're working on something for her, but in a different capacity. What are you working on for no, her? I can't tell you. A different capacity. Come on. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? She might wear it to the grocery store. I don't know. Quick reminder, in early April of 2019, the Swifties were in the trenches as Taylor relentlessly teased her upcoming album, which we didn't even have a name for at the time, on Instagram. Fast forward to June 7th, 2019, and Christian Serrano posts this to Instagram with the caption, Proud to be a gay designer. Hashtag happy pride everyone celebrating in DC this weekend. Can't wait for this gown to come to life. Who will wear it? The comments on the post are filled with people guessing, Taylor Swift. I'm guessing this is for at Taylor Swift. This has to be in the video for you need to calm down. Taylor Swift? Like this if Taylor is wearing this to world pride tomorrow. Taylor, it better be Taylor. The Instagram post has over 4,000 comments. For reference, Christian Serrano's posts usually get around 50 to 100. And I want to say a solid 70% of those comments had something to do with Taylor Swift. Now, fast forward to June 30th, and Billy Porter takes to the streets of New York City in the dress for Stonewall 50. Let's not lie, Billy Porter slayed so hard here. Fast forward to today, and Taylor has yet to wear another Serrano dress. So what happened. If you look closely, there's what appears to be a flesh tone fabric under the bodice of the dress. The thing is, though, this flesh tone does not match the tone of Billy Porter's flesh. It looks a lot closer to matching the skin tone of one Miss Swift. There were also apparently rumors circulating that several people in the industry had thought that a coming out from Taylor Swift was coming on the 30th only for it to not happen. So the theory is that the dress was originally designed for Taylor to wear to Stonewall 50, but she backed out at the last second, leaving the dress vacant and in need of a wearer. So Serrano turned around and found someone that he's worked with before, you might remember this dress from the Oscars, and adjusted the dress a bit at the last second. And that's why it doesn't appear to fit quite right, and the flesh tones don't even almost match. This was nothing but rumors and speculation until nearly one year later, when Christian Serrano posted this to Instagram, where it remains to this day, with a caption, This is just fan art by at Lily Swifty, but I love this dress on Taylor so much. Happy Pride Month. That's suspicious. That's weird. Serrano isn't exactly in the habit of posting fan art on Instagram, but Maybe this was just a coincidence. Wait, is that a TikTok of a prominent gayler explaining the Taylor Swift Christian Serrano pride dress theory that Christian Serrano stitched with the dress in the background while he's sipping tea? He deleted the video pretty quickly afterwards, but of course you can't really delete anything from the internet forever especially if the Swifties have anything to say about it. Messy, messy, messy. This is about as close to confirmation as you can get without him outright stating that the dress was originally designed for Taylor, right? Some of you might be wondering though, if the dress was designed for Taylor, why didn't she wear it? Why did she back out? Some Swifties may remember that June 30th, 2019 was a big day in Taylor's life for another reason. Because it was June 30th, 2019, at 7.10 a.m. Eastern Time, when the Wall Street Journal published the article. You know, that article. If you aren't caught up on the Taylor's Masters drama, I don't know why you're watching this video, but all you really need to know comes from Taylor's Tumblr post that she posted later that day. 
When I left my masters in Scott's hands, I made peace with the fact that eventually he would sell them. Never in my worst nightmares did I imagine the buyer would be Scooter. Any time Scott Borchetta has heard the words Scooter Braun escape my lips, it was either when I was crying or trying not to. She also wrote, I learned about Scooter Braun's purchase of my masters as it was announced to the world. That means, if the theories are correct, that Taylor Swift woke up the day she was planning on coming out to the world, a major step for anyone, much less one of the largest pop stars in the world, to the news that worse than her worst nightmares had come true. Whether she was just feeling overwhelmed or didn't want a coming out to send fans scrambling to listen to old music fattening the wallet of Scooter Braun, she canceled her plans to come out and Christian Serrano quickly repurposed the dress for Billy Porter. That's the theory anyways. It's important to remember that this all is just theories, and while there's a lot of supporting evidence, we don't know for sure. But when I first heard it, I was fully convinced. I think because it's just too devastating of a story not to be true. Anyways, the point of this video is not to convince you to become a gayler. I really don't care what you think about Taylor Swift's sexuality. But I've noticed there is a tendency among Hitlers to just dismiss gaylers as delusional, to just laugh them off and move on. But I want to challenge that assumption. So I'm going to run through a non-exhaustive list of all the best evidence that I think we have that proves that Taylor might be queer in chronological order up to the announcement of the Midnight's album. That clip that appears to show Taylor Swift and Carly Kloss kissing at a 1975 concert. That time she tweeted me, out now, on Lesbian Day of Visibility. Time she said gay pride is what makes me, me. Cats, gay pride, people in country western boots. I start riding a unicorn, like just everything that makes me, me. That time she dyed her hair, the bisexual pride colors for the music video of her gay anthem that includes the lyric shade never made anybody less gay. The hairpins in Right Where You Left Me Why is nobody talking about the hairpins in Right Where You Left Me? Some of you might not get that last one, so time for a history lesson. For those who don't know, the phrase hairpin drop or dropping hairpins has a deep history of queer meaning. It comes from a time in history when queer people could not be publicly out but still wanted to get to know and meet other queer people. It also comes from a time in history when the term queer was a slur. It has since been reclaimed, thank goodness, because it's a lot fewer syllables than LGBTQ. So publicly, they would stay secretive and keep their hair up, but hint at their own queerness in a way that only other queer people would understand. This was referred to as a hairpin drop. The language of keeping your hair up and dropping hairpins was used from what I can tell, even before the language of the closet and coming out. That's why the Stonewall riots were referred to as the hairpin drop heard round the world, because normally a hairpin dropping is quiet. But this was the first time that queer people really came together to make some noise, to say, we are here, you will listen to us, and you will respect us. And they said it loudly. So having pinned up hair means presenting yourself to the world as straight, and dropping hairpins means dropping subtle hints that you're not. With that out of the way, let's look at the song. The song is called Right Where You Left Me, and it's a bonus track for Taylor's ninth studio album, Evermore. The song seems to be about a long-ended relationship from the perspective of someone who hasn't been able to move on. Friends break up, friends get married, but I'm right where you left me. Then we get to the chorus and... I swear you could hear a hairpin drop Dust collecting on my pinned up hair no. If Taylor is one thing, she's the queen of capitalism. But if Taylor's another thing, She's a lyricist. This simply feels too obvious for it to be a coincidence. Many speculate that the restaurant she talks about in the song may be a metaphor for the closet. She's stuck in the restaurant, stuck in the closet with dust collecting on her pinned up hair. People also speculate that because Taylor has such a public life, it would be really hard for her to come out publicly without it affecting the other women that she's had relationships with. Taylor would not be able to come out without the media dragging people like Carly Kloss and Diana Agron into the drama as well. She would essentially have to get their permission, get their blessing, if she wanted to come out. Perhaps this song is about one of her exes coming to her and saying, I would rather you not come out because I'm not ready yet. I'm right where you left me. 
you left me in the closet. It's also possible that this story doesn't come from Taylor's personal life. It could be a fictional tale, but either way, it is a very gay song. It's also entirely possible that Taylor, knowing that she has so many queer fans, included these lines to help the song be more relatable to them. She's always been praised for her ability to write songs about her personal life that her fans also feel personally connected to. So that's definitely a possibility. If you still think, after all this evidence, that Taylor is a straight woman, that's fine. However, there are so many Hetlers online that will defend poor, defenseless Miss Swift's heterosexuality with their full chest and just be absolutely appalled at the thought that anyone might think for a second that she might be queer, when not once in her over 15 year long career has she ever publicly stated that she is straight. The closest she's ever gotten to making that claim is in an interview with Vogue during the Lover era. When she was asked why she was getting louder about advocating for LGBTQ rights right now, she said, I didn't realize until recently that I could advocate for a community that I'm not a part of. It's hard to know how to do that without being so fearful of making a mistake that you just freeze. Because my mistakes are very loud. When I make a mistake, it echoes through the canyons of the world. It's clickbait, and it's a part of my life story, and it's a part of my career arc. I'm not part of the LGBTQ community is not the smoking gun that Hitler seemed to think that it is, though. Because you can be queer and not feel like a part of the LGBTQ community. If there's anyone who feels like not a part of the community, I imagine it would be Taylor Boy Crazy Swift. And she's clearly choosing her words very carefully here because as she says later on in the quote, she's painfully obvious of the way that the world is watching and listening to her every move. So if you are queer, but you wanna stay in the closet without having to lie, saying I'm not a part of the LGBTQ community would be a very easy way to skate around that point. If at this point your instinct is still to say, no, she has to be straight, my question is, why? <laughs> like, we've all seen the evidence I just presented. It's certainly not definitive. I don't know Taylor personally, and she's never defined her sexuality publicly, so I don't know for sure. But neither do you, so what could possibly be your motivation for being so stubborn besides, dare I say it, homophobia? But, but it's interesting. Would it be so terrible? But at this point, if you're still willing to call Gaylor's delusional, crazy, or stupid, then I have to assume that your answer to that question is yes, it would be so terrible. Again, I don't care what you think Taylor's sexuality is, but there is no reason for you to go online claiming for a fact that you know. That makes you look kind of delusional. And that goes for Gaylor's too. There are some Gaylor's online who use the language of, well, us Gaylor's know that Taylor Swift is queer and the Hetlers just haven't figured it out yet. That language bothers me when it comes from Gaylor's too. That being said, the Gaylor community is a lot smaller than the Swifty community in general. A vast majority of Swifties are Hetlers. The reason I came swinging for Hetlers first is because it's become increasingly common for me to find TikToks of Hetlers stitching with Gaylor's innocent theories, essentially just to cyberbully them for analyzing the queer themes they found in Taylor's music. See, the majority of Gaylers are queer themselves, and the majority of Hetlers are straight themselves, and it just really saddens me to see what the Swifty community has become. A place for the straight members of the community to bully the queer members of the community for carving out a little space for themselves. I'm telling you, the Gaylers have really been in the trenches this whole time. It's a good thing they're strong because they have to fight for their lives out there when a casually homophobic anti-Gaylor TikTok tweet or a Tumblr post can get thousands of likes without even trying. Here's a video of someone belittling a uh, Gaylor for her interpretation of the song Evermore. And for what? <laughs> I'm not going to get into the queer readings of any more of Taylor's songs in this video, but they're actually really interesting whether you subscribe to Gaylor theory or not. Evermore is a song that has deep personal meaning to me, and when I heard her reading of the song and her interpretation of its meaning, 
it only expanded my appreciation of the song as a piece of art, whether her understanding of how the lyrics apply to Taylor's personal life are accurate or not. Let me know in the comments if you would be interested in seeing me do a deep dive into Taylor's music and queer reading of her discography. And that's all not to mention some of the real-life consequences that have come from the drama surrounding this community during Betty Gate of 2020. To quickly catch you up on Betty Gate, when Taylor released her eighth studio album Folklore in 2020, that album has a track called Betty on it. When Gaylers saw the title and heard the song, they were obsessed, of course. Then Taylor came out and said the song was actually written from the perspective of a boy named James. So not actually gay. Many Hitlers took the opportunity to clown on the Gaylers for daring to think that a love song written to a woman might be Taylor hinting at her own sapphic feelings. During Betty Gate of 2020, some young Gaylers were doxxed and outed to their parent by the Hitlers. It was really messy and honestly terrible. The Gaylers really have been fighting for their lives this whole time. The Gaylor community has its own problems, of course. There's some infighting, like there is in every community. Like, some Gaylers think that Taylor's a lesbian, while others say that that assumption just stems from biphobia. And I really don't love the way some Gaylers talk about Joe. Yeah, I think it's time to talk about Joe. Joe Alwyn is a British actor and Taylor Swift's boyfriend since 2017, allegedly. They've kept their relationship very private the whole time. They almost never talk about each other publicly, and they're almost never seen together publicly either. And you know what? Good for them. They deserve their privacy. But how do the Gaylers deal with their relationship? Well, in a couple ways. The most obvious by saying that Taylor is bi or pansexual, and just happens to be in a relationship with a man right now. Some Gaylers remain steadfast that Taylor's a raging lesbian and Joe is just a beard. And it almost sounds plausible to me considering how little they're seen together or talk about each other. Like maybe it's not that they're doing a really good hiding their relationship, maybe it's just that they don't actually have a relationship. Some theorize that Joe himself is gay and they're each other's beards. There's also a theory that Taylor is secretly dating Blake Lively and Joe is secretly dating Blake Lively's husband, Ryan Reynolds. I'm just gonna say it. That theory's a little weird. Yes, that's foreshadowing. There are also some Gaylers who really are not the biggest Joe Alwyn fans. Let's be honest, there's quite a few Gaylers who kind of actively hate him. I also think that's weird. Maybe let's stop that. I don't need to get into the weeds about all the theories that Gaylers have about Taylor and Joe's relationship. I'm not trying to convince you that Taylor is a lesbian or bisexual or anything in particular. I'm just asking that you have a shred of empathy for where the Gaylers are coming from because it's time to talk about the Midnight's album rollout cycle. Messy, messy, messy. <laughs> it's August 28th, 2022 at the VMAs and Taylor Swift has just won Music Video of the Year for All Too Well, the short film. She takes to the stage for her acceptance speech and says this. I, I thought it might be a fun moment to tell you that... <laughs> that my brand new album comes out October 21st. Later that night, Taylor posts this to Instagram and we're officially in the Midnight's era. Of course, the Swifties do what the Swifties do and immediately start searching for clues and Easter eggs in everything. The album cover post is accompanied by this picture covered in text that says, We lie awake in love and in fear, in turmoil and in tears. We stare at walls and drink until they speak back. We twist our self-made cages and pray that we aren't, right this minute, about to make some fateful, life-altering mistake. Of course, the Gaylers were speculating instantly. Self-made cages could be another closet metaphor, praying that she's not about to make a life-altering mistake. If this is her coming out album, could that be what she's referring to? Is she worried that coming out might be a life-altering mistake? On September 3rd, Rolling Stone published this article. Some Taylor Swift stands hunt for clues to queerness in promos for the new album Midnight's. An important thing to remember here is that Taylor has historically had a very good working relationship with Rolling Stone. So many speculated that it would be unlikely that this article got published without approval from Taylor or someone on her team. I'm not sure that that's how that works, but this article was a big deal in getting more eyes on the theory and the community. 
On September 13th, Target announced their Target-exclusive Lavender edition of the album with three bonus tracks, which is a big deal because lavender is, in fact, the gayest color. Okay, that kind of sounded like a joke, but if you didn't know I'm actually 100% serious, time for another history lesson. Like the phrases hairpin drop and pinned up hair, the color lavender has a deep and rich history of queer meaning. That's some tie all the way back to the 7th century poet Sappho from the island of Lesbos, who wrote extensively about her love of women. But the color's association with the queer community really solidified itself in the 20th century. Earlier I referenced You Need to Calm Down as a gay anthem, and I stand by that. I think it's really fun and catchy and has only gotten better with time. But have you heard the first gay anthem, Das Lila Lied? Pardon the pronunciation, the only German I speak is the fake German from the intro of that one Lady Gaga song. I don't speak German, but I can if you like. <laughs> Written in Germany in the 1920s, Das Lila Lied is generally considered to be the first ever gay anthem. You'll never guess what it translates to in English, the Lavender Song. The English translation is also kind of a banger. The crime is when love must hide. From now on we'll love with pride. We're not afraid to be queer and different. If that means hell, well hell will take the chance. We were all probably taught about the Red Scare in high school. That time in the 1940s and 50s when Americans became extremely paranoid that communists were infiltrating our government. President Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450 in 1953. It put the Civil Service Commission and the FBI in charge of investigating federal employees to make sure that they didn't pose a threat to national security. The investigations conducted pursuant to this order shall be designed to develop information as to whether the employment or retention in employment in the federal service of the person being investigated is clearly consistent with the interests of national security. Such information shall relate, but shall not be limited to the following. Any criminal, infamous, dishonest, immoral, or notoriously disgraceful conduct, habitual use of intoxicants to excess, drug addiction, sexual perversion. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why is that there? Sexual perversion is obviously referring to homosexuality here. Apparently many Americans at the time thought the homosexuals were susceptible to blackmail because they would do anything to keep their secret. Like they would do the dirty work of the communists just to protect the secret of their sexuality. So it's probably best to just fire them, right? Just in case. And that's what they did. Something like 5,000 federal employees lost their jobs and were publicly outed as a result. And countless others weren't considered for the jobs they were applying to just for being a suspected homo. This was part of a larger trend at the time of increased hatred and vitriol towards gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. This trend, considering its timing in history and its close association with the Red Scare, was dubbed the Lavender Scare. In 1969, Betty Friedan, the president of the National Organization for Women, apparently thought that lesbians were a great threat to the movement for women's liberation. So she dubbed the growing lesbian movement a lavender menace. Being the iconic gays that they were, a group of lesbians decided to reclaim that term and painted the phrase on their t-shirts. They stormed the stage at the Second Congress to Unite Women in 1970 to spark a discussion about the liberation of lesbian women. In 1973, the band called Lavender Country released its debut self-titled album, with songs such as Come Out Singing, Back in the Closet Again, To a Woman, and Straight White Patterns. Lavender Country was the first album openly centered around gay themes. They also just released their second album, Blackberry Rose, in February of this year, 49 years later which I thought was interesting. The term lavender marriage refers to a marriage between two queer people who aren't attracted to each other, just out of convenience, usually a gay man and a lesbian woman. The gaylers who think that Joe is also gay think that Taylor and Joe are in a lavender relationship. The lavender song, the lavender scare, lavender menace, lavender country, lavender marriage. The color lavender in the year 2022 is inseparably tied to the struggles and triumphs of the queer community. It is a gay color. So, when Target announced their Lavender exclusive vinyl, the Gaylers were elated. They were convinced it was a reference to her queerness. Like, a Lavender CD on its own doesn't necessarily mean that Taylor's gay, but 
the hairpin drops have been adding up. On September 15th, Taylor posted a TikTok and Instagram reel in this top. If you didn't know, those are the lesbian pride colors, like the exact colors. The next day, September 16th, she posts again, also wearing colors evocative of lesbian pride. The gaylers were having a field day. On September 19th, Rolling Stone posted this photo to Instagram, exclusive. Taylor Swift shares a photo of her recording T.S. Midnights at Jack Antonoff's studio. Mere weeks after Rolling Stone posted that article speculating on her sexuality, Taylor gives them an exclusive photo. This all but confirms to me that she was not mad about that article. Taylor, especially these days, has no problem calling out things she has a problem with publicly on the internet. I'm reminded of that time that some flop said that Taylor doesn't actually write her own music. She absolutely tore him to pieces, but Rolling Stone got an exclusive photo. This signals to me that she's not really concerned about people speculating on her sexuality. So if you were thinking to yourself, isn't it problematic to be speculating about someone publicly like this when they haven't come out themselves? Like, how is this different from outing them? First, outing someone requires that you have personal insider knowledge. That I don't have. I'm just commenting and making connections on already public information. And second, she clearly doesn't care. The next day, September 20th, Taylor posted the first episode of Midnight's Mayhem with me. This is the series where Taylor, allegedly, leaves it up to fate to decide which track titles to announce, using a bingo ball cage. She started out posting one episode every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This gave Swifties plenty of time to come up with all sorts of crazy theories in between episodes. People were looking at the way she was holding her hands in the videos. People were listening for which syllables in each word she would emphasize, trying to find a pattern there. I wasn't above it either. I was counting the number of turns she gave the bingo ball cage, trying to find some pattern there. We were truly in the trenches. Every day I would get on TikTok to Swifty saying, I did it, I cracked the code, I found the Easter egg, this bingo ball has the wrong letter on it, this video's caption has this many characters in it, and all this stuff, but I simply do not have the time or energy to get into those right now. Not to mention, I don't think any of them ended up being right about anything. Anyways, let's get into it. Here is Taylor announcing the track titles. Track 13, because of course. Track 13 is called... Mastermind. Track eight. Vigilante shit. Track seven. Is called. Question. Track six. Track six is called. Midnight rain. Track two is. Called. Maroon. Track three is called. Anti-hero. After this episode of Midnight's Mayhem with me, Taylor posts this Instagram reel, kind of explaining the contents of the song. I really don't think I've delved this far into my insecurities in this detail before. She says it dives super deep into her insecurities. How nice of her to give an explanation of the track before release. Hopefully she does that again for other tracks. Be careful what you wish for. Track nine is called... Bejeweled. Track 11 is called... Karma. Pause. What? If you didn't know, rumors have been circulating for a while that Taylor has a secret missing album that was meant to come out out in 2016, after 1989. People think this for many reasons. She had released an album every two years without fail since 2006, until the extra long wait between 2014's 1989 and 2017's Reputation. The theory is that her bleached hair moment was meant to be the style and vibe of this new era, but her plans were foiled when all the Kimye stuff was going down. But we didn't have a name for this missing album, until January of 2020, when Taylor Swift released the music video for The Man. In the music video, Blondie is dressed up as a man. She like pees on a wall. It's very odd. On the wall in graffiti is the name of all of her albums with an extra bonus word in the middle next to a sign that says missing 
if found, return to Taylor Swift. That word? Karma. Swifties went searching for hidden Easter eggs that they missed before this album would have come out, and they found this moment in the 73 Questions interview. What do you think is the most important life lesson for someone to learn? That karma's real. At this point, the Swifties were convinced Taylor meant to have an album come out in 2017, and it was called Karma. Sometimes I think Swifties are a little too quick to believe theories, but this one always seemed to kind of hold water to me. Not to mention, on November 26th of this year, Rolling Stone published this article, Is Karma Real? Inside the Mystery of Taylor Swift's Lost Album. For those keeping track at home, that's two fan theories that the Rolling Stone has speculated on and reported on since the start of the Midnight's era. And as of episode 8 of Midnight's Mayhem with me, they've got some momentum. The next day, Taylor releases episode 9 of Midnight's Mayhem with me. Some of you know it's coming. Let's just watch it. So it's getting very exciting. The tension is palpable. What's it gonna be? Track one. Track one is called Lavender Haze. For a few brief and blissful moments, the Gaylers were happy. This was a hairpin drop, if you've ever heard one, right? Lavender Haze is track one on Midnight's. Okay, another explanation. And I happened upon the phrase Lavender Haze when I was watching Mad Men. And she got it from Mad Men. And I looked it up because I thought it sounded cool. And it turns out that it's a common phrase used in the 50s where they would just describe being in love because we live in the era of social media, and if the world finds out that you're in love with somebody, they're gonna weigh in on it. Um, if the world finds out you love somebody, they're gonna weigh in on it. That sounds pretty gay to me. Like my relationship for six years. Oh. My relationship for six years. Oh, it's about Joe. We've had to dodge weird rumors. Dodging weird rumors. Tabloid stuff, and we just ignore it. Um, and so this song is sort of about the act of ignoring that stuff to predict to protect the real stuff. So the Gaylers were not happy with this Instagram reel and there's a lot of reasons why. There's a lot of layers to peel back here. Its release and the subsequent reaction came to be known as Lavender Gate. But I just wanted to speed through the announcement of the last four track titles before we get into that, just to get them out of the way with no fanfare because that's how the Gaylers experienced them, feeling defeated. Track five is called you're on your own, kid. Track 10 is called Labyrinth. Track 12 is called Sweet Nothing. Track four is called Snow on the Beach, featuring Lana Del Rey. Okay, I just wanted to get this out of the way. There are several reasons why this Instagram reel upsets so many Gaylers, but because she seems to reaffirm that she is still in a relationship with Joe is not one of them. I only say seems because some Gaylers point out that she doesn't refer to Joe by name in the video, and she also doesn't even use gendered language, so we can't assume anything. I won't be commenting on that, I don't know for sure. There are three main reasons why Gaylers hate this video. Problem one. Weird rumors. Some Gaylers took the weird rumors comment very personally. They saw it as Taylor calling Gaylers weird and were offended by that. I will say, when I first watched the video, I did not get the impression that she was calling Gaylers weird. If anything, I thought the weird rumors she was referring to are rumors that the Hitlers came up with, like her being secretly married for several years, or her being secretly pregnant, or secretly already having a kid, or several, they're all pretty weird. Maybe the r rumors about her dating Blake Lively and Joe dating Ryan Reynolds are a little weird, but those are very obscure, and they're not in the tabloids or anything that she's had to dodge publicly, because they're very, very niche in small corners of the internet. But generally, the rumors that Gaylers come up with are not 
weird. The theory that Wonderland is about Diana Agron is no weirder than the theory that The Moment I Knew is about Jake Gyllenhaal. The theory that Dress is about Carly Kloss is no weirder than the theory that Dress is about Joe Alwyn. You might think that they're less likely, they might not be true, but that doesn't make them weird. The implication there would be that Taylor dating a woman would be weird, and I certainly hope that's not what she was saying. The one widely held belief that Gaylers have that I could understand why Taylor might view it as weird is the theory that Joe is just a beard. Because if it's not true, and Taylor really has been in love with this man for six years, and she logs onto Tumblr to find a section of her fan base saying, oh, they don't actually love each other, it's all just for show, how that would feel weird for her. But in the end, I think the weird rumors comment was so vague that it ends up just being a wash. We don't have enough evidence to show that Taylor was calling Gaylers specifically weird, so I don't think there's any reason for Gaylers to take offense to that personally. Problem two, the enabling of bullying. The second problem Gaylers had with this video has to do with the problem of the enabling of bullying. Like I mentioned earlier that some Hitlers have the tendency to cyberbully Gaylers. But what's the one thing that Gaylers and Hitlers all have in common? Taylor herself. Generally, for the most part, Gaylers and Hitlers will keep to their own respective parts of the internet, and they'll have their little spats back and forth every once in a while, but they generally do a pretty good job respecting each other as Swifties. The Hitlers might think that the Gaylers are a little weird, but they like Taylor Swift, so at least they have taste. But then this Instagram reel dropped, and I talked about the reasons why I don't think that Taylor meant to call the Gaylers weird, but that didn't stop the Hetlers from thinking that that's what she was doing. Weird rumors, tabloid stuff, and we just ignore- <laughs> You're joking, like you're kidding. Not only did she just absolutely end every single Gaylor in existence, she called them weird. <laughs> I can't get over it. Um, this is hilarious. Whether she was referring to Gaylers or something like the pregnancy rumors, it didn't end up mattering because lots of Hitlers decided to use this video as a justification to attack the Gaylers. In the Hitlers' minds, this seemed to be Taylor not just giving them permission, but sending them on a mission to bully the Gaylers into silence. The Hitlers think to themselves, Taylor thinks the gay rumors are weird, and it's up to us to stop them, by any means necessary. And to some Gaylers, it really feels like, intentionally or not, Taylor has enabled their bullies and hasn't done anything to stop it. And honestly, I really sympathize with that perspective. I mean, just look at some of these TikToks that have come out since Lavender Gate. and the Gaylor Swift subreddit had to be set to private after Lavender Gate because the negativity got so bad. You might think to yourself, it's just a little bit of internet trolling, it's not that bad. And maybe it's not to you, but try to remember that this community is filled with lots of marginalized people. I imagine many of them love their little community online where they get to get together with other fans of Taylor Swift and talk about the queer themes in her music and just get to escape from the negativity in their real life. And they just had their cute little online community flooded with hate and homophobia and negativity as a direct result of something that Taylor herself did. I imagine that doesn't feel very good. I don't want to put too much blame on Taylor because especially if she is queer, she's in a very tricky situation that doesn't necessarily have a rule book for her to follow. For all I know, she's trying her best to take care of herself and her fans, and maybe this was just a little misstep. Like she said in that interview I quoted earlier, my mistakes are very loud. When I make a mistake, it echoes through the canyons of the world. It's clickbait, and it's part of my life story, and it's part of my career arc. I don't feel the need to add to that pressure, but I also don't blame any Swifties who choose to go all Wendy Williams on her after this. I am done with Taylor Swift. Yup, 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 yup. I was a Swifty. I was down. Problem three. I don't really know what to call this one. The final issue Gaylers had with the Instagram reel is difficult to summarize in one word because I don't think there is one word for it. Different Gaylers have talked around this issue in different ways, but from my perspective, 
it seems to really all come back to one issue, which is why I put it all in this one point. But it gets real complicated real quick, and there's lots of terms that I'm going to be using that I should probably define first, so time for a vocab lesson. Queer baiting. The act of... The act of the loudest car you've ever heard making the loudest noise for no reason. The act of stating or implying that a piece of art or media will have queer themes or characters for marketing purposes, only for those queer themes or characters to be underwhelming or non-existent. Think live action Beauty and the Beast. Remember when Disney was so proud, they are like, this movie has their first openly gay character and that gay character was LeFou and you could only tell because he danced with another man in like this one shot at the very end and it was two seconds long and literally like a blink and you'll miss it moment. It's complicated because sometimes it can be difficult to tell what's queer baiting and what's subtext, but usually it's pretty obvious, especially in things like large blockbuster movies, that companies just want to have it both ways. The problem is trying to sell a product to queer or progressive audiences without actually making a product that queer or progressive audiences would want to purchase out of fear of alienating the more conservative audience. Cultural appropriation. The act of adopting practices or elements of one culture by someone who's not a part of that culture. Think like white people dressing up in Native American clothes for a Halloween costume. Cultural appropriation is also complicated because it isn't necessarily a horrible injustice to appropriate a culture that isn't yours. It becomes an issue for some when a person who belongs to a historically oppressive group appropriates the culture of an oppressed group. It's especially problematic when the appropriator is part of the group that oppressed the appropriated. It's doubly especially problematic when the appropriator makes money off of the appropriation. And it's triply especially problematic when that person makes money at the expense of the appropriated people. Straight washing. The act of portraying queer people or ideas as straight. Think when archaeologists dig up a grave at a historical site and they find two men or two women buried together and they go, oh look, they were just really good friends. Just, just two best friends. Headsplaining. The act of explaining away queer themes or ideas in something that is gay to make it appear not gay. For example, in the Instagram reel we've been talking about, Taylor headsplains why she has a song named after the gayest color. As far as I can see, this is a whole word invented by the Gaylor community. If they weren't the first to use it, they certainly were the first to popularize its use. When you Google the term, you only get about 1,500 results, and pretty much all of them are in reference to Taylor Swift. Even the Urban Dictionary definition is all about Taylor. Side note, I don't think the Urban Dictionary definition is very good. It says it's kind of like mansplaining, but it's really not. Mansplaining involves a man using the social capital afforded to him by virtue of him just being a man to talk down to or belittle women. Headsplaining doesn't have anything to do with heterosexual people talking down to gay people. If anything, it's queer people who have to headsplain the most if they're trying to stay in the closet. This word also has a corresponding noun form. When Taylor headsplains a song, she gives a headsplanation. Queer baiting, cultural appropriation, straight washing, and head splaining. All right, with that out of the way, what's the third issue the Gaylers had with the Instagram reel? Some say the issue is that Taylor's queer baiting. I think I understand what they mean when they say this, but I have to agree with the Hetlers that say that it's a misuse of the term, especially if what they mean by it is Taylor is queer baiting for herself. Queer baiting is something that's done for works of fiction or art, not for individual people. So it could be possible that Taylor's queer baiting for Midnight's, but to say that she's queer baiting for herself would be a misuse of the term. I also understand that there are some people who would say that Taylor Swift has become more of a public brand at this point than a person, but at the end of the day, she is still a person. And I think using the word queer baiting in this context makes everything needlessly messy. Queer baiting is also always done intentionally with the intent of making more money. People queer bait because they want the money of the gays and the homophobes alike. Now listen, we all know that Blondie loves her some money, but I don't think we have enough evidence to say for sure that things like the Target exclusive Lavender Edition or the naming of a track Lavender Haze were done with the intent to string Gaylers along and take their money 
just to drop them in the end for the larger general audience. There are some Swifties out there who will say things like, Taylor's a genius. She knows exactly what she's doing at all times. She's all powerful, all knowing. They really deify her in a way that convinces them that every little Easter egg that they think that they found was intentionally placed there by her in the way that they interpret it. And I just think maybe we need to take a step back and challenge that assumption. I think we'll have to wait for the album to actually come out before we can say anything definitively about queer baiting, but I don't think Gaylers are wrong to feel touchy about the financial aspect of Lavender Gate. Another kind of connected complaint I've seen is the accusation that Taylor Swift is appropriating queer culture. Some Gaylers, especially the ones that just joined the community during the Midnight's rollout cycle, felt that this reel confirmed that Taylor is, in fact, a straight woman. But since falling down the rabbit hole, they have all this information about Taylor connecting herself with a queer community. They suddenly have all this knowledge of all these hairpins she's been dropping, that they don't know what to do with. They're suddenly very aware of all the hairpin drops, the lesbian colored tops, the bisexual colored hair, the explicitly queer lyrics in songs like Right Where You Left Me. And now suddenly they feel queer culture being appropriated by a straight woman. To be clear, I don't think simply wearing a pink, white, and orange colored top is appropriation deserving of the worst cancellation of all time, but things really were adding up. I think the worst example of Taylor's possible appropriation of queer culture comes from the music video of You Need to Calm Down. I don't have any problems with the general concept of the song and video coming from a straight woman, but it is an explicitly gay video which would make a straight woman dyeing her hair the bisexual colors in it not a good look. Remember when I said cultural appropriation becomes problematic when it's done by a person in an oppressive group? appropriating the culture of an oppressed group? Well, who do you think was oppressing the bisexuals? You might say that blue, purple, and pink are just colors, but in that order, in a music video about queer rights? The problem with claims of cultural appropriation is that we have no way of knowing whether Taylor is appropriating someone else's culture or just participating in her own. Unlike claims of cultural appropriation with regards to race, it's impossible to tell if someone is queer unless they tell us, and Taylor hasn't told us yet if she ever will. That's why every TikTok or tweet or anything accusing Taylor of appropriating queer culture has to start with if she is straight, and that was a very common thing to see in the immediate aftermath of Lavender Gate. It's died down a bit. Most Gaylers have, in fact, calmed down since the release of that Instagram reel. So I don't think it's necessarily helpful to spend a lot of time discussing whether or not Taylor is appropriating queer culture at this moment, because there are other issues with Taylor referencing queer culture so much and yet remaining silent about her own sexuality. Here's where we really get to the heart of the third issue Gaylor's had with Lavender Gate. We can't say for sure yet whether Taylor Swift is queer baiting, we can't say for sure yet whether Taylor Swift is appropriating queer culture, and we may never be able to. What we can say for sure is that Taylor has contributed to the straightwashing of queer iconography. Because even queer people can contribute to straightwashing, we don't have to know her sexuality in order to criticize this. And since Lavender Gate, it's really hard for me not to criticize her for this, because with her explanation of the song Lavender Haze, she has contributed to the straightwashing of the color and the erasure of its queer history. Whether she meant to or not, by implying that the song Lavender Haze is about her relationship with Joe, she's created this connection between the color lavender and heterosexuality. It probably wouldn't be that big of a deal if Taylor was an out straight woman, but because she isn't, and because she has this segment of her fan base who has reason to believe that she might be queer, and because the vocal majority of her fan base doesn't think that, what ended up happening? Well, a large group of people suddenly felt very comfortable yelling at a community of gay people that lavender is just a color and Taylor did nothing to stop it. The silver lining of things like Lavender Gate might be that Gaylers are learning a lot of queer history because of it. Like, I learned about the Lavender Scare because of Lavender Gate. By the way, some people who are directly affected by it are still alive today and telling their stories. The videos How Florida Legally Terrorized Gay Students by Vox and The Lavender Scare, The History They Didn't Teach You by Time, both include really moving interviews with older gay men who were alive at the time. I recommend you go watch those. Listen to your elders. But for every Gaylor learning about queer history, 
there's 20 Hitlers who are learning that it's okay to tell gay people that lavender is just a color that doesn't have any special significance to any group, which is not true. Not to mention the official Taylor Nation Twitter account has been retweeting heterosexual couples describing their own relationship as lavender since the release of that Instagram reel. It's all just very messy at the moment. Because I'm an extremely loyal person, I want to believe that this is some masterful 3D chess move, and when the song comes out, it's going to be very clear that it's actually about a woman, or about how her relationship with Joe is a lavender one. That is to say, they are each other's beards. I want to believe that she's going to make all those people shouting, lavender is just a color, look like the fools that they are, but that's kind of giving QAnon Trump loyalist vibes. For all I know, this really was just a misstep. Again, we'll just have to wait and see. And if Lavender Hayes really is just about how in love she is with Joe, be prepared for lots of queer people to go all Wendy Williams on Taylor. Just because you like somebody doesn't mean you always have to agree with them. So be very clear, I am hating on Taylor Swift right now. And don't judge them too harshly for it. If Taylor is queer, but doesn't come out with this album and wants to keep dropping hairpins, she is going to have to tread very carefully. Because she's still perceived as a straight woman by the general public, every explanation she gives has the potential to cause the same problem. I also hope that you understand from this video that the Gaylor community is so much more than just speculating about Taylor's personal life. For many Gaylers, that isn't even the primary purpose of their involvement. It's about finding community with other queer people who like the same artists as you. It's about learning queer history. It's about interpreting media critically with an eye for queer themes and ideas and language. I feel like after this Friday, anything could happen to the Gaylor community. It's in a precarious place. That's part of the reason I wanted to make this video. If she does come out as something other than straight, that's going to be a major moment in future queer history. I wanted to document what it was like living through the moments leading up to its release just in case. Her coming out would essentially mean the end of the Gaylor community itself. If she makes some sort of statement coming out as straight, that would also mean the end of the community. If she continues to do this whole straight washing queer erasure thing, then the Gaylor community might slowly fizzle out. If she doesn't say anything definitive, but her lyrics continue the trend of slowly getting more and more sapphic, maybe the Gaylor community will just continue to grow. Anything could happen. Despite everything I've talked about today, I am still extremely excited for the release of Midnight's. I'm just a big fan of Taylor's music, and at the end of the day, I'll probably continue to listen no matter what. Like, it would take a lot to change my mind. I guess we'll find out at midnight. Oh, and don't forget, Carly Rae Jepsen's new album, The Loneliest Time, also comes out this Friday. Can't forget my girl Carly. I am done with Taylor Swift. Yup, 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 yup. I was a Swifty. I was down. Just a little tough love, uh, Taylor. Get it together. Yeah.